In his 2004 book, England and the Need for Nations, Roger Scruton identified a phenomenon on the left, and also sometimes on the right, in the West, of a certain xenophilia, or preference for foreign cultures. He defined this as oikophobia, oikos being Greek for home, literally meaning fear of the home, or as Scruton defined it, repudiation of the inheritance and home. Scruton said that oikophobia was the opposite of xenophobia, which is irrational fear of the foreign. Oikophobia is in essence a fundamental rejection of one's own group. It can be expressed through negative attitudes towards one's own culture, traditions, family, civilization, or all of the following. Contemporary examples of oikophobia could include the decision of the San Francisco School Board to remove a mural of George Washington from one of its public schools, or overhear the targeting of the statues of national heroes such as Nelson and Churchill by largely white mobs, or perhaps the recent cancelling of Canada Day over First Nation Canadian concerns. Mark Dooley describes oikophobia as centred within the Western academic establishment on both the common culture of the West and the old educational curriculum that sought to transmit its humane values. He says that this disposition has grown out of, for example, the writings of Jack Derrida and of Michel Foucault's assault on bourgeoisie society, resulting in an anti-culture that took direct aim at holy and sacred things, condemning and repudiating them as oppressive and power-ridden. Oikophobia has existed in academic institutions for a long time. In Notes on Nationalism, written when Britain was in a struggle for its very existence, George Orwell noted that, in societies such as ours, it is unusual for anyone describable as an intellectual to feel a very deep attachment to his own country. Scruton also associated oikophobia mainly with intellectuals, but also applied it to the cosmopolitan elite that does globalised intellectual labour, or what Scruton calls urban elites. Their sense of membership, their circle of trust, is with others like themselves across borders. As Scruton says, like the aristocrats of old, they form their networks without reference to national boundaries. They aren't attached to a particular place or a particular faith, and their language is the international language of commerce. They are about the enlightenment universalism of human rights, and they regard all localism, including patriotism, as xenophobic chauvinism, as all about experience from which they have been liberated by their membership in a universal class. As Scruton observed, the oikophobe is, in his own eyes, a defender of enlightenment universalism against local chauvinism. He sees that which is his own, his inheritance, as alien. He has fallen out of communication with it and feels tainted by its claim on him. He wants to be free of that claim, free from the pressure to belong, to be with us, to love something, believe in something, accept something which is his. Therefore, he portrays his home as something other, by means of a stereotype that seems to free him from all obligation towards it. At the same time, he cultivates a promiscuous xenophilia, picking up other cultures in the supermarket of postmodernity and toying with them, as a child toys with the channels of a television set. Of course, this is not real xenophilia. The other cultures are always seen through a sentimental haze, and can be zapped off the screen the moment they begin to be disagreeable. Set him down in the midst of some cultural minority in Harlem, say, or in a Shiite village in Iran, and our multicultural intellectual will be overcome by nostalgia for the American way of life, and aware of America as his proper home. But so long as he can merely play with alternatives, a possibility which universities eminently provide, xenophialic fantasies can drift unhindered through his mind, and he can wallow in a luxurious bath of nostalgia for a home that will never be his. Like with many other things, then, oikophobia is a phenomenon that has leaked from academic institutions into public life. Scruton said that the result of this is that the loyalty that people need in their daily lives, and which they affirm in their unconsidered and spontaneous social actions, is now habitually ridiculed or even demonised by the dominant media and educational system. The repudiation of home is what distinguishes modern intellectuals. The philosophers of old, from Socrates to Hume and the Victorians, repudiated the being while attempting to preserve the seeming of home. They were about preserving what people, including themselves, needed to live well. Intellectuals now instead seem hell-bent on attacking the very core of our meaning and livelihood. The habits that govern ordinary life, which are mostly unconsidered and unchosen, yet 
absolutely indispensable to be at home in a particular place in the world are allegedly outed as the behaviour of thoughtless suckers. These habits in persons make up for what might be regarded as an instinctual deficiency in members of our species, and their spontaneous effectiveness can't really be replaced by calculated deliberation about everything or even most things. The wholesale repudiation of loyalty disarms, in both theory and practice, what freedom we really do have, what can't be sustained if detached from its relational context. The confidence of the cosmopolitans campaigning against Brexit, including the respectable leaders of every part of the British establishment, is that they could, with their scientific deployment of big data, both scare and cajole people into not voting against their economic self-interest. Globalism benefits everyone, they claimed, but it turns out that openly treating people as merely economic actors has its limits. It's not true, for one thing, that the benefits of going cosmopolitan or oikophobic are evenly distributed. Being proudly homeless is not good for everyone. For another, people want to be treated as dignified citizens and experience the social trust of sharing a way of life under the rule of law. Roger Scruton said that our existence as citizens freely participating in a state is made possible by our enduring attachments to the things that we hold dear. Our condition is not homo economicus, searching in everything to satisfy private desires. We are home-building creatures, cooperating in the search for intrinsic values. Finally, Scruton does give what he sees as a solution to oikophobia, saying that the diseases which are created by thought can be cured by thought. Traditional education, philosophy, criticism, history has always been hostile to the stereotype, the stock response, the foregone conclusion. The intention was to teach young people to see the detail and complexity of human life, to exchange their simple falsehoods for complicated truths, and to respond to the human world as it really is, without sentimentality. And it can still be done. We can confront people with the arguments and the works of art which will dispel their oikophobia and cause them, if not to love our civilization, at least to recognise its virtues. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and uh, thanks for watching. See you later.